We're back. Uh, we're back. Okay. Uh, this is a few hours later. Actually, it's the next morning. And we were talking about Iran. And Heather, I just wanted to say that one of the flaws I see it in the argument against the, uh, the NIE stopping the neocons or, or the administration from going through with their plans to bomb Iran was, I think, as I was trying to say before, the calculation was such that Iraq would be so damaged and we could not prepare for the counterattack from the Iranians that at least the, the, the policy, as I understood it, was never eventually we're going to bomb before Bush leaves office. It was let's try to put as much pressure at this point as they're mastering the fuel cycle to get them to relent and like sort of step away and then um, and sort of to, to take this uh, diplomatic approach, which I think you know, in many ways, uh, would, is, a, is very, very similar to the, the Clinton administration approach to uh, Iraq and uh, other, other sorts of things. So I think that that was, that was the, the policy all along, and it was a, a miscalculation from many on, the, um, uh, on, on your side to think that this was all cover for uh, in, in some, an invasion or, or bombing Iraq. Eli, that's either a wildly generous interpretation of Bush administration policy no. or it's like the finale of the TV show when the character wakes up and it's all just been a dream in the preceding five seasons. But um, if if we've decided that the, the neocon Iran gambit is now a dream sequence because of the NIE, then you know that's a fabulous result of the NIE, and I'm, I'm prepared to leave it there. Um, I wanted in our last segment... Well, no, I, I, I just on that last point, and, I, and I'll be very quick. The people who wrote the NIE in this sort of, I think, deliberately deceptive way agreed with the left because I think that in many ways they sort of they they want a um, they want to deal with Iran. But I'm saying that the the actual policy of the Bush administration, contrary to the, um, the speculations of people like Barnett Rubin, wasn't was never bomb first, ask questions later. It was what I described, which was. Pressure, pressure, pressure in the hopes of finding that rational actor who will in turn um, stop the enrichment uh, which had already been sanctioned, which had, which had already been rejected by um, you know, all five permanent members of the UN Security Council, the Germans, and, and, and you know, everybody. That was, the, that was the idea. Now, I have to say, now I feel like I'm the one who's been living in a dream sequence because we definitely have had lots of discussions about, you know, there is no rational act and we have to be prepared to take action. There was certainly a lot of rhetoric. Well, I'm not, I'm not the Bush administration. No. And, I, and I would just, I, I think on the rational actor point, I would just make this, and I, and I just, because I've been thinking about it because of the result and part of our conversations in the past, there's a re within the context of an Islamic revolution, the Iranian um, security services and the people vying for power in Iran are quite rational. Um, they they act in what they see as their interest. Their interest, I would say, is 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 a Khomeini type revolution. Um, but it's but they are rational in that respect. They are not rational actors in the sense of sort of realists like to say all nation states have the you know common interests that they always will act towards those kind of basic interests. Um, you know, sometimes there's that, but most mostly there, there. It's a revolutionary regime. Well, you know, I am also not a big one to defend these sort of all states have the same definition of rational yeah. approach to the world, but as an art realist, yeah. but you can also actually look at what you know, not necessarily the the uh, revolutionary guards, but um, the more um, sort of establishment, quote unquote, parts of the Iranian leadership wants, and it really does fit pretty comfortably. Into a into a realist paradigm in terms of wanting to be able to be a player in the region, um, wanting to have their wanting to be cut in on everything that happens, um, and they've chosen some pretty unacceptable and un unorthodox tools to do that, okay. um, which necessitates us to push back. But the realist paradigm is not at all useless for understanding um, what it is that the Iranians, under any administration with anybody in power, and here, you know, your point about the elections not producing, you know, some peace loving. Doves who will want to sort of walk over and present all their nuclear weapons to Ted Turner is is well taken. That that Iran, no, no, the, the, the Iran is always going to want yeah. to be a regional power and is always going to want to push back on Saudi Arabia and others. And as such, you know, we're always going to be in a difficult position. They weren't the leading exporter of terrorism, though. I would care less about the nukes. Right. So then the question is: Is there a way? You know, and this this gets back to to your point about mm -hmm. who wants to negotiate. Is there a way? that you can convince the Iranians that they can get what they want through other means, at the same time making it clear that they can't get what they want 
through the unacceptable means. And that's where, you know, to me, the, the um, Bush-Cheney policy was fundamentally flawed, was that there was no... There was no indication of how they could actually get what they wanted. There was just a lot of indication of how they could not get what we didn't want to let them have. But um, I really, I think that's okay. probably enough. Well, we, we will we'll go round and round. Yes, but, we certainly will. Uh, we will go round and round. Agree to disagree. All right, right so what so, did you, we have a few other topics that we wanted to end on. What, what, what we, we want to talk about politics in the primary process. Yeah. So I've been nagging you to talk about All politics right. just because sure. there's so much going on. And I think, you know, here again, instead of just doing the horse race thing, um, there's been a fun little dust-up going on in, in my end of the blogosphere in the last day or so. Um, Ilan Goldenberg, Ezra Klein, Dana Goldstein have all jumped in about whether this election is and should uh, turn on foreign policy issues or whether we're actually turning back away to domestic issues and whether that's a good thing. And mm -hmm. I make the point, which I sort of keep making until I'm blue in the face, and it's, it's really getting rather tiresome, that um, you got to start thinking about national security policy as a domestic issue. That it, it has mm. now, for better and for worse, passed over into the category of issues that we treat like health care, like education, that there's a set of ritualized incantations that each side makes and, and everybody tries to sort of figure something out from, except that we're not sure what those ritualized incantations are yet. So, you know, one of the interesting things mm -hmm. I think about the, the Democratic primary process is you see different candidates, and frankly the same candidates over time, trying out different incantations to see what it is that will give a big enough chunk of the public some comfort level. And you also see, you know, at least the, the smarter of the Democratic primary candidates trying to think about what they can say that will make the base happy in the primary that will also make the middle of the road happy in the in the general election, and, you know, my candidate, Senator Clinton, gets in trouble for this, but it's also, I think she's laying down a very smart pathway for, for herself, or frankly, if she doesn't get the nomination, that someone else will be able to take advantage of. And I was, I mean, you look at the, at the Republicans, and right now Republicans are behaving much more like your stereotype of primary Democrats. You know, they're all over the map. Nobody knows what's going on. And the issues that seem to be really uh, dividing people or bringing them together or giving somebody an advantage are, are domestic issues. And what does that mean in terms of the Republican base and national security? Well, if you take out Ron Paul, all the Republicans agree that, you know, now is not the time to completely get out of Iraq, whereas I, at least I think most of the Democratic primary voters, it seems to be their, one of their main issues. And so Iraq is, is going to be one of those points that, that defines on the primary. And I, and I put it like this. I think that politics, American democratic politics, I mean, our politics, are in many ways driven by the people who care the most. And so the people who are most drawn to the process in this election cycle are people who care about issues of war and peace, probably as their number one issue. On the Republican side, I would call these people victory voters. On the um, Democratic side, they're the net roots. And that's why they're in the process, and they're willing to volunteer for candidates. They're the people who will show up at primaries or caucuses, and um, they they do care about national security. I don't know what the average voter cares much about it, but I would say that the sort of classic, like you know, competing, you know, the the, the, the competition for the undecided, or the moderate, or the center, the, the, the center. Americans, I don't think that it, they, they think about the issues as much, so it's harder to say what convinces them, you know, at the end of the day of what they want to see in their, in their candidate. But I think you're absolutely right that you're not going to get away from foreign policy. I think the reason why you have on your side in the Democratic Party, um, the, this generation of political activists is because of the Iraq war. And I think the reason that you have a new kind of generation of people in the Republican Party who are concerned about you know, who were in the process to begin with, their raison d'etre is because of 9-11. And, uh, you know, that's probably not, that's not going to change for this cycle. And, uh, you know, I can't predict the future. And see, I would, I would argue that the, the sort of your ordinary voter actually mm -hmm. does care quite intensely about this issue, but doesn't know, doesn't know what to look for. So that if you, if yeah. you, you know, you guys have a chunk of, um, right. of religious voters and who have picked up a certain set of issues that are their indications on values that they may not, they may not be able to figure out, you know, which of all these people running really they feel most comfortable with having, you know, in the pew with them at church, but they can take abortion as a litmus test or whatever the other issue is. And, you know, on 9-11, it looked for a while as though Rudy Giuliani was sort of going to be the litmus test on that. But, but with him falling in the polls, I guess I'm just asking myself, what is it 
What is it that reaches your voters on national security? I'm, I'm just curious about that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think that, um, that when they I think in a weird way, it's a symbiotic relationship. When there's a threat that the hippies on the other side are going to end the war and uh, create the Department of Peace and, uh, you know, pass a law that says American foreign policy has to be subordinate to the United Nations, that's the kind of thing that gets out voters on the other side who are voting very much against it. Just as I would argue, probably the prospect of, um, you know, a hardline candidate who, who Democrats think will start wars with Iran or Syria or something like that will probably get out a lot of the, um, the primary voters on, on the left. Um, so sometimes I think, you know, American voting behaviors are motivated by, some, by whatever it is you're against. Um, and that's, I think, a big part of it. Um, secondly, I just don't know what to make of, like, Mike Huck Huckabee. He's a tabula rasa when it comes to foreign policy. And when he says stuff about foreign policy, he sends almost a little bit like Jimmy Carter, who was also a really religious guy and a very, you know, very dedicated Christian. And I'm, you know, that doesn't do it for me. <laughs> no way. So um, I'm a little, you know, I mean, he just, I think he's so new that he's kind of just finding his sea legs on that. And uh, I just, I don't know. It just seems that the latest stuff with Rudy, and I, I just get the impression, that I don't know if he can recover if you have an ongoing indictment and investigation of Bernie Carrick, unless you think that nothing new is going to come out of that. But that just seems like it's pretty damaging uh, to him. And then Romney also strikes me a little bit as a blank slate. So you're right. The candidates are a little bit all over the map. But I think on issues of victory, um, which is how Republicans talk about the big war, there's not that much difference. And whereas I would say that on the um, on the Democratic side, I think that they resent even the idea of someone trying to frame it that way. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we, I so much resent the idea of someone trying to frame it that way as, as I view right. it as deluded. But like, what they always like, um, what is victory? What what is victory? What is war? What are these things, Heather? Well, now I was actually imagine thinking, there's no heaven. Oh, now you've got me beat on the <laughs> metaphysics side because your your mention of Jimmy Carter actually seems very on point. Sort of the right. whole the whole flow of discussion we've had in this kind of otherwise not very yeah. flowing episode is that you you know you think about Carter, and I think this is applicable to Huckabee. It's applicable to Obama and maybe some others in the race as well. That here you had a guy who, as you say, came in with. I mean, actually, it's not really fair to say he had no foreign policy experience because, you know, having been in the military and on a submarine, he understood a heck of a lot more about how yeah. how the apparatus works than, right. you know, either Huckabee or Obama would. Um, and came in with really some ideas that, that profoundly flowed out of his religious experience, um, his human rights convictions, and really wanted to do foreign policy a different way, but ended up, you know, caught in these horrible internecine battles between um, Brzezinski and Vance, um, and wound up, you know, actually, as you know, um, really, he, his administration laid the foundation for the Reagan military buildup. Um, his administration allowed the battles among Democrats to, to fester and to, to really swell into... Not to mention uh, arming the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Indeed, indeed, but I mean... Not to mention uh, going along with and encouraging Iraq, uh, Saddam's invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, Iran, not Afghanistan. I mean, I'm sorry, like, so it's an invasion of Iran, absolutely. No, but it's the early. point I was going to yes. make is that if you, yeah. you know, we Americans, we tend to view the clean slate thing as, as almost sort of mystically wonderful. But right. if you come in without the tools to push back on what's presented to you, you get it Carter. seems to me you, you, get, you get swept into the yeah. stream of what's already going on. And I think that's, I think that's really appropriate to the, to the torture debate we were having, that you actually... You actually need someone a little hardened and cynical about how, yeah. how things actually work here to, to have any hope of doing anything differently. Um, yeah, like maybe John McCain. Oh, well, you know, I'm glad you said that because it wasn't my place to say it, but I, I certainly think of, of your people, he's the one that I would have the most hope to actually, that would actually, if we had to have another Republican president, that would really get rid of some of these things. And on that cheerful note, should we uh, wish our viewers a happy new year? Happy New Year, viewers, and if it's, uh, it's Jesus' birthday coming up, yep, um, happy Jesus, happy Merry happy Christmas. Happy Jesus, happy Christmas, Eid happy Mubarak. Kwanzaa. Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak, yeah. Happy Kwanzaa. Right, happy. Belated happy Hanukkah. Yeah, I was going to say, we hope you've recovered from your, your oil-induced yeah. indigestion over Hanukkah. There you go. And we will look forward to seeing you in January. And we'll see you in January. Right, and atheists, just enjoy the sales. <laughs> happy, yeah, happy sales day, atheists. Right, hey, okay. Thanks a lot. It's fun. It's fun. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.